reading through the Bible in a year. January 1st, Genesis chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, Ezra chapter 1, and Acts chapter 1. Welcome to a new year. If you've gone through this with me before, you can hit the skip button and just go straight to Genesis chapter 1. Um, this is an introduction that's intended to kind of explain my process, the way I do these things, and why. Uh, my name is Ian. I've been reading the Bible consistently since 2008, um, year by year. I've read through a bunch of different uh, reading plans over the years, and my favorite is still the McShane reading plan. Through the McShane reading plan, you read the Old Testament once and the uh, New Testament Psalms and Proverbs twice throughout the course of a year. I found that it's the one that most consistently, I guess, references itself as it goes through. It, it makes it a lot more fun to read as you're able to follow themes as you go through the text. Um, that's kind of a main thing that I like out of this. I am by no means a professional. Um, my entire reason for doing this entire process for you is that I just want to get people into reading the text themselves. That's why I have all of the text up here for you, so you can see it, and so you can uh, read through, and if you have questions, concerns, you can pause and read through the notes. That's why they're there. I want to make certain that if you have things that don't make sense to you, you can Stop and see what other people have thought on the same thing. You can ask me questions. I've had a lot of people do that over the years. Um, and I don't really edit these videos. It isn't that I don't care so much about the uh, production quality. I put a lot of time and effort into producing these well. Um, in fact, the whole reason why I'm redoing the ESV is because the ESV was the first one I did four years ago. And I'm not confident or happy with the way that it turned out. There were a lot of um, missteps and struggles early on that I have since overcome. And so I want to go back and redo that. And I know if you've been following with me at all, I had mentioned that I wanted to do NIV this year. I will do it next year. Um, next year, I'll start the NIV 1984. Got a whole theme planned. It's going to be awesome. <clears throat> that said, when I have struggles in reading, I leave it in here. The only time I'll ever edit is if something from work pops up on the screen and I have to edit that out. That's happened once or twice, but it doesn't much happen anymore. Again, the first year, all the time. So now we're going through and redoing that. Now, what do we have here on the screen? On the far right and left hand side, aha, it's... Over there, there we go. Um, we have the text itself. Um, as we go through the text, um, every time we come to a new book, there's an introduction that's included in the ESV, and I read through that introduction. These are good to have because it gives you information into um, uh, who the author is, what the intent of the book itself is, um, and it gives you an idea of kind of what you're going to expect as you read through the book itself. Now, in the center, we have the notes from the Reformation Study Bible. I am a Reformed Baptist, um, and I'll just go ahead and say this. Now, you're going to be getting notes and comments from me as a Reformed Baptist. It's just the way things are. Um, originally, I started doing this so that my um, daughter, who lived away from where we were, because she was in college, um, so she could follow along with our Bible reading um, that we were normally doing at home. So I started recording it for her, and I started getting people following, and that's how we are here now. And I always stop and include notes or comments from my um, years of, of debating people online and um, my constant study of the text. Um, I have a lot of friends who are seminarians who uh, have been in actually a, a large range of different types of schools and come from different thoughts. Um, I grew up very Arminian. Um, 
and it's by God's grace alone that he has now converted me fully to being a biblicist. Um, that's somebody who takes the entire Bible literally and believes in what it says. Um, I had many struggles, had many questions, concerns, problems. Um, and so I read a lot of books. I went to a lot of experts. I asked a lot of questions as I went through these things. And so if I have something that I had a question on, I'll stop and I'll explain it. Because these are things that I had questions on. If someone that I know had struggles in this area, I'll stop and explain it a little bit. If it's something that I think that the notes explain well, I'll pause and just read the notes themselves. But just know ahead of time, all of my thoughts on this are going to come from a Reformed Baptist perspective. Um, I've been in a... We move a lot. So, I've been in a bunch of different churches. Um, throughout my time as a Christian, I grew up ELCA. Um, very... Uh, progressive Lutheran church. That's what I grew up in. Um, when God saved me, I had a lot of struggle trying to find out what it was I should believe. Um, we bounced from a bunch of different churches at that time. Um, we, for a short time, we were very independent, a uh, fundamentalist Baptist, KJV only. Um, we were in Calvary Chapel for a long time, um, and just in a bunch of different churches. We, we kind of bounced around through a lot of them. And I learned from all of these places. I learned about the people, the way that they learned things, why they learned things, the, the things that people tend to stick to and why that is. Um, we have friends and family in other denominations as well. And because of these things, I've had a lot of questions that have been thrown to me. So, when I come across things that I see that are pretty common, I'll stop and speak on that as well. Also, um, I've had a lot of debates and discussions with a, a vast array of different people through both witnessing, yes, Calvinists care about evangelism. And um, what's another way to put it? Um, spirited discussions with angry atheists. Um, those are some of my favorite. Um, I forget who it was who said it, but um, basically, if you, if you take a rock and you huck it into a dark alley, the dog that yelps is the one who gets hit. Um, angry atheists are my favorite because they're the ones who constantly are throwing themselves in the way of the rocks as they want to attack. It's, it's, it's fun for me to engage with these people um, because I myself was an angry atheist. I enjoyed taking Christians down and attacking them for what they believe. I had... Well, only one thought, and it was that there is no God, and I hate him. And that was my kind of modus operandi for a long time before God eventually saved me. So, when I come across things that I've had discussions with before, or when uh, I come across something, and you'll see this happen quite a bit, if I come across some section in the text where there's something bracketed, we're going to stop, and we're going to discuss every single one of those. Because that's normally something that isn't found in the oldest and perhaps best manuscripts that are available, in parchments and fragments and what we have from antiquity. But they're still included now because people expect to see those in there. So, we're going to cover a whole bunch of these things. Back to what we see on the three panes here. Again, on the far left-hand side, we have the text itself we'll be reading through. In the middle, we have the Reformation Study Bible Notes. Um, these are notes specifically from a reform perspective. Um, I like using them because uh, when God first saved me and when I was just devouring as much uh, of the word I could get my hands on, um, R.C. Sproul's ministry at Ligonier spoke so deeply to me. I miss him to this day and... 
I I 100% stand behind uh, the the ministry that he left. I understand they're Presbyterians. I have no problem with that. Some of them don't like me. That's okay because, you know, we differ on some secondary issues. Absolutely nothing uh, that's a core doctrine of the church. Just secondary things. Things that you would uh, choose one denomination over another over. That's it. Back to the text. So, on the far right-hand side, we have the ESV study Bible notes. These are, from everything that I've seen and read, these are the most concise notes that cover the widest possible range of opinions on on any given subject. So, when you come across something, you'll typically find as you read through the notes, it'll say, well, here's what the text says. And one group of people believes it's this, and another group says this, and another group says this, and another group says this. And it covers all of those different ranges. And then at the end, it'll say, but we, as in the people who wrote the notes, believe that this is the one that's most likely, and here's why. But again, it gives you a much wider view of a lot of these different things. So, these notes are going to be available to you. I will do my very best to make sure that we cover all of them, that all of them are available to you as it goes by. I'll still have my little picture down here in the corner. And the reason I do that is because I found that it, um, it makes it a bit more personal. And it certainly helps with the reading. Um, in the same way that a text message or an email doesn't convey as much information as the spoken word, um, I found that in video, this helps quite a bit to be able to look at someone, um, especially for me. I have a very expressive face when I'm speaking. So it helps to understand the, the intent of what I'm saying. All of that said, this is a fun project. If this is your first time going through reading the Bible, congratulations. If it's your second time, if you just finished reading with me yesterday and you're back here today, um, you will have heard my spiel on this in that reading the Bible isn't a one and done thing. We as Christians need the word daily. We learn from it. We grow from it. It is meant to be treated as our daily food and not something to be had just for special occasions. So, because of that, it's good to stay in the Word every day. And scripture promises to us that it will not return void. When you read the Word, when you meditate on it, when you think on it, when you take the time to go through it, you will continue to learn from the text that is here. And God will make sure of that. Every time you read it, even with me, when I continually read this text, every time I read it, I'm able to pull more information out of it. And I've been reading for a long time. And we still continue to see new things every time we read together. Now, as you start on this journey, of Bible reading. One of the things you'll note is that as you're reading through the first time, and no one's going to deny this, there's a lot of information here. Now just imagine flipping open the, um, uh, the yellow pages and just reading through that for fun. There are some sections of the text that is almost exactly reading through the yellow pages. Now, the, all of these things are here on purpose. They're here to teach us the history, the historicity, the, the fact that God is there for his people. But who are his people? Well, these are things that are defined in the text. Who is God? That is available to us in the text. And most importantly, does God come to man at any point to ask him for his opinion on something? Does God stop what he's doing and go, I wonder what humanity wants to do with this? 
let's go ask, let's go, let's go present to them a poll. Maybe ask them for their opinion on different things. Well, if you don't know whether or not that's there, how can you as a Christian really stand on anything one way or the other? I mean, sure, you can go to your pastor, your elders, and you can ask them to, to explain it for you and to tell you what to think. But we're supposed to be renewing our minds day by day through the reading and instruction found in the Word. You're not supposed to be just dependent on others to tell you how to think. As much as atheists like to joke that um, where their opinion is, is the more intellectual one, and Christians just check out their mind once they become a Christian, the fact of the matter is, it is an intellectual religion. God wants a complete devotion from our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we can't provide that if we aren't spending the time to learn about who he is on his terms, not our terms. When I was first a brand new baby Christian, I would go to the Bible and I didn't know how to read it. So, I'd flip through it and find a text and I would read it. And God in his, in his grace and mercy was good to me in that, in that he was feeding me what I needed, but I knew that wasn't right. And I knew that it was hard for me to, to learn and understand these things. It was very hard for me to find resources where people would be able to stop and explain to me the things that I didn't understand. So, I bought commentaries and lots of other books. And I went through it in a lot of detail trying to figure out what it is that the text was trying to say to me. I went in, and this is a, this is a religious term, but I was eisegeting a lot of the text. I wasn't exegeting it. In that I was reading into the text what I wanted it to say. I went to the Bible to find something that would bolster my own personal view on something. But I kept finding over and over and over that I couldn't find anything that did it just right. So I started reading it for what it had to say. I was then pulling out of the text what was there. Now, the process of this is called hermeneutics which is a fancy term, but basically it's the art and science of interpretation of old text. The Bible is 66 books written to individual, not individual people, but to, to groups of people who would have understood it in their time as something written directly to them. There are many things we're going to come across that we can't directly relate to things that happen today. For instance, in the New Testament, we're being told uh, to greet one another with a holy kiss. What is that? How, wh wh where, hmm, how does one do that? Is that something we should continue to do today? What does that look like? These are things that we find in the text, but it's hard to understand if we just take it on flat whatever it says. So, this is why we need something uh, to help us understand what's happening. We need to understand the context of what the people are going through. Uh, a great example of this is Jeremiah 29, which has that great text in Jeremiah 29, 11, Behold, I, have, uh, I know the plans that I have for you, for good and not for evil. I've seen that verse slapped on, on everything from backpacks to, uh, you know, graduation cards and all of these things. The context of that is that it was being delivered in a letter from Jeremiah to exiles who had been taken out of Jerusalem and taken away into Babylon. They thought they were never going to see their families again. They thought everything had just completely been destroyed. They thought that they had been taken away in shame. But Jeremiah had been saying for uh, countless chapters, the ones who go to Babylon are the ones that will survive. It is a letter of promise to those people because everyone left over in Jerusalem, 
they're going to suffer. They're going to suffer intently because of their continued and continual, persistent idolatry and rejection of the God who saved them. This isn't meant for soccer moms to slap it on the back of their minivan and say, oh, it's my life first. Because that's not what the text is for. And I know that this saying this alone is probably going to offend some people, but the fact of the matter is that we have to take the text on its terms, not on our terms. We have to understand it based on what it has to say to us in the context that was originally given. And that's what we get with this. That's what we get with this reading plan. That's what we get with going through the text ourselves. We can grow together. We can learn together. And most importantly, you can give a defense for the things that you believe. No longer just waiting for someone else to come along and tell you what to believe. You can defend it yourself. So your first time reading through the text, you're placing waypoints. That's it. Literally, it's a slog through a lot of these things. But you're learning and you're growing and you're learning the stories themselves and these specific contexts that they were given. The second time you read, you're finding those waypoints that you laid down the first time. And now you're laying new waypoints. Just little reminders of where you were. The third time you read it, it's the same thing. But by the fifth time, those waypoints start to merge. The sixth, seventh, and eighth times. You're, you're no longer depending on waypoints. You're now flowing through the text. You know what's coming next. And you're learning more about the people and the stories underneath there. Every Christian I talk to says that they have specific verses that they love, but they can't tell me the verses that they dislike. You'll get to develop that. Now, I'm not saying that, oh, Christians have to love everything in the Bible. The entire book of Judges is the hardest book for me to read through. Every other book, every other place we come across something, there's redeeming things we can pull out of it. The book of Judges is a snapshot of what happens to Israel two generations after they are brought into the promised land and they immediately reject God and everything falls apart. They go into slavery. They're being attacked by enemies left and right. They're terrified. And even their priests start falling into wanton idolatry. The end of that book is probably one of the hardest things for me to read, just because it breaks my heart over what happens over a nation that rejects their God. And it's, it breaks my heart every single time I read it. But these are the things you're going to be able to understand. These are the things that are available to you as we continue to read the text. Now, what can you expect? Normally, um, the reading ends at about 23, 24 minutes on average. When we get to some sections, I mean, obviously today is going to be a bit longer because we're going through, we're doing all of the introductions that are in here. Um, uh, one for each chapter we go into. Um, some have longer chapters. You'll see some of that as we get into books like Jeremiah. Um, some have more notes. Some have more things to park on and discuss. Sometimes those end up getting 40 minutes, 45 minutes. But in general, you're looking at about uh, 23, 25 minutes per day. And we'll probably get there about three or four days into this reading. You'll see how it goes. We're going to drop into a rhythm and we'll continue on through the text. All of that said, I am a man 
and I will err. God has moved my theology around from place to place quite a few times. Um, not, you know, believing like Jesus is a walrus or whatever, but, you know, just moving from things like I was a, a hardcore Tim LaHaye-ish, um, uh, pre-trib, pre-mill dispy, and now I'm a millennial. This comes from reading through the text over and over. God could move me over time. I've had plenty of friends who were um, died in the wool Baptists who would become Presbyterian. These things happen as people progress in their theology. I've had plenty of other friends that I know who have moved from Presbyterianism over to um, being a Reformed Baptist, and we welcome them every time. These things happen. There's nothing wrong with that. Your theology changes, as we'll read in Romans 14, based on the will of God. He's the one who determines where your theology resides. And it will happen that you, uh, what you were learning at five years ago isn't where God wants you to learn today. He might move you from one church to another. All of these things are done to progress your theology to drive you deeper into the text, deeper into your relationship with him, and deeper into your trust in him. So when I say that I err, some things that I've said, I've been wrong on. And if you see it, let me know. But again, I've done this a lot for many years. I've had a lot of people go through with me and kind of critique what it is that I'm doing and saying to kind of help align me. And now most of the quibbles that I have are people who have personal preferences, the things that they would want to read and see. And that's okay. We can have a difference of opinion on things. But our spirit-fueled conscience is that which binds us to what God is teaching us. And that is where, um, if there's something in the text that I read, that I see, I'll explain it that way. If you read it in a different way, then that's okay. So long as you're not reading your own thoughts into it, and you're letting the word speak for itself, It could very well just be that God is leading you on a different path. That said, where are we? Um, As as an aside, um, I don't have any notes at all. I have a notebook here to keep track of where I am time-wise for things, so I can put the little chapter lines in. Um, This is all entirely contemporaneous. As I'm reading through the text, if the Lord so leads me, I'll start explaining something for you. Um, I will struggle with words. This happens quite a bit. Uh, You'll see it probably even today where I'm going to run into some words and have to start over. Um, I lose my spot. This is what happens when you read the Bible. Um, You will lose your spot. And you have to go back through and find where you were and start over. Um, Sometimes you read things wrong. That happens to me a lot. Um, uh, It happens to everybody. If you're reading through a book, you'll read the wrong word in the wrong place. Um, Or, as happens with me pretty often, because I've read the text so many times, um, in different translations, I'll accidentally say something that another translation would say. That's what I do. But that's why the text is here. So you can read along. And you can go, oh, he meant that. Okay, we're cool. And then keep going. So, all of that said, um, I love the ESV. Um, the ESV, um, I was born and raised on uh, King James. We went to NIV in 1984. Um, and uh, that's another one that I grew up on. Um, I've liked the new King James quite a bit. Um, as I started getting more and more into textual criticism and learning about the differences in the text and why some say one thing and some say something else, it's um, there are a lot of oddities that come from the King James and the Textus Receptus from whence the King James comes. 
Um, so I don't prefer that text anymore. Uh, the text that I do prefer for daily reading is the ESV, the English Standard Version. Um, I don't, I don't like the term version. Um, uh, talks about, oh, well, there's different versions of the Bible. No, it's all the same text. There's different translations. I would prefer if it was the English Standard Bible or English Standard Translation, but then it just looks like Eastern Standard Time and everybody gets confused. You can't set your clock by the, uh, by the text. You can try, but it doesn't work. Um, I've got a couple small quibbles with it. Um, I personally prefer uh, any time that you see L-O-R-D in all capital letters. That's what's called the Tetragrammaton. And it's translated for us as Lord. Well, what it means is Yahweh or Jehovah. I prefer that especially when going through text where it says, you know, the, the Lord, 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 where you read the word Lord uh, six times in one sentence, I would prefer to have Yahweh in there. So I might default to that. You'll just hear it come out. You read the word Lord. I'm saying Yahweh. I'm a broken man. This is what I do, but I, it's kind of how I prefer the text. Anyway, um, that said, um, the very last thing we're going to speak on here is Logos. Um, I've been using Logos since, I think, 2004? 2005, maybe? I don't remember. I got it at a, at a Worldview conference. They were doing a spiel. Um, I went into debt to get it the first time. <laughs> Please don't do that. Um, and I've been using it for a really long time. Like I said, we move a lot. I have crates full of books that I never open anymore because almost all of them are in Logos. Uh, as far as software goes, I love it. Um, I love the fact that I can do things like this. When I write sermon notes, I write them all inside of um, at Logos because it makes it so easy for me to be able to just make a reference and link to it. So I have a blog. It's horrible. Nobody ever reads it. But if you do find it, um, you'll see my sermon notes listed in there. I write all of those in Logos because it makes it so much easier for me. I'm that nerd at the back of the church who has his laptop out during the sermon and I'm typing the whole time. That's what we do. But I'm not sponsored by Logos. It would be swell if they did, but I've already given them thousands of my dollars um, and I'm not entirely certain that they can add much more to what I have, but if they want to, Hey, <laughs> by all means, um, that said, um, if you have questions, concerns about Logos, let me know. Um, I've given walkthroughs on it to quite a few people. Um, there's another piece of software that I've used called, um, Accordance. I own both. Um, again, I make poor decisions with money. But it's nice to have another option if something happens to Logos to have something else I can default to. Um, I haven't yet had a reading where I've had to stop the reading and, or, or and where I couldn't do it because something was broken in Logos. So I would revert then to Accordance. But if need be, I do have that available with all the same notes. So I can have that as a second, as a backup option. So if one day... You follow along and everything looks different. That's probably what happened. That said, we are now 34 minutes into this. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the text. As I said before, um, we always start off with the introductions. So let me mark down the time here. And now let's go ahead and move on to the introduction for the book of Genesis. As its name implies, Genesis is about beginnings. Genesis tells us that God created everything that exists. Now, you'll see this throughout the text where God is referred to as the creator God. The reason for this is if God is... I'm, I'm a, see, I, I told you. I contemporaneously speak about these things. Um, God is referred to as the creator God, and it's super important that we understand this. Because if God is the creator, as again, scripture 
directly tells us that he is, then this means that he owns all things. Everything was created for his purpose, to his glory. The universe wasn't created so that you and I could live our lives to our best potential, that we could go and seek and serve ourselves to our own ends. We were created with a purpose, and that purpose is to bring glory to God. So, you'll see God repeatedly referred to as the creator God. This also differentiates him from the um, gods of the people in the area. They would have gods that are gods of specific hills or sp- uh, specific valleys or specific trees or, or like a mountain range or the skies or the birds or the water or other things. Yahweh, as the creator God, separates himself from all things. We'll see this also as we read through um, Acts 17 where Paul is speaking at the Areopagus to a largely Gentile group of people. And he gives a masterful walkthrough of what it means to... what it means to question who God is, which is perfectly fine, especially as a Christian. There's nothing wrong with questioning who God is. But he does this this masterful walk through of revealing to the people who God is on his terms. It's a great thing. We'll get to that later. Back to the introduction. Whew, it's going to be a long day. So, uh, God created everything that exists. It shows that God is both the creator and the ruler of all creation. But it also tells of humanity's tragic fall into sin and death and of God's unfolding plan of redemption through his covenant with Abraham and his descendants. Genesis includes some of the most memorable stories in the Bible, beginning with Adam and Eve, chapters 1 through 4, continuing through Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and ending with the life of Joseph in chapters 37 through 50, who died before 1600 BC. Traditionally, Jews and Christians have recognized Moses as the author, writing after the exodus from Egypt. Commonly dated around 1440 BC, though some prefer a date of around 1260 BC. Let's begin. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. There was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from uh, from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. You're like, "What, what, what is this? Literal water on the ground, the water of the sky. King James calls this the firmament. We all call it air. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. As an aside, um, this heaven you'll later see Paul refer to as uh, a time that uh, he knew of somebody who was exalted to the third heaven. This isn't like a Mormon thing. There are different views of what's called heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. Second heaven, that's where the stars are. The third heaven, that's where God lives. The three heavens. Continuing on. Ah, verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters were gathered together, that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. 
And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its own kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and I told you this was going to happen. So, um, Logos, as I'm scrolling through on the side over here to make sure you don't lose the notes, um, it will jump around from place to place, and it will jump my text up, which makes it hard for me to find it, but that's okay. Um, do, 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 do. Um, yep, verse 12. Uh, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, uh, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let there be um, lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser uh, to rule the night. And, and, excuse me, and the stars. And God sent, God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with uh, swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. The note here on kinds, it's not saying and God created, uh, you know, Pomeranians and German Shepherds and uh, all of these. No, the kind is dog. He created dogs and cats and cattle and all of these other things by their kind. And when he created them, they were all genetically perfect. Every mutation we've had since then that's created different variations of these kinds. We've seen lots of different variations. Anytime there's a mutation that occurs, what is it that's causing that? It's a loss of information. So, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing variations in kinds. Not that God created every possible animal that could exist in a moment, though he could have. He created kinds of animals. That's important. <laughs> Build the plan to do. Okay. Uh, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the, uh, the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over everything that, uh, that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with its seed in the fruit, and you shall have them for food. That's right. 
the beginning, everybody was vegetarian. That changes later. We'll talk about that in about five chapters. Eight chapters. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Bringing up the rest of the notes here for you. Here we go. Let's move on now to Matthew chapter 1. I warned you ahead of time, today is going to be very long. Let's go and read the introduction. The Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as Israel's Messiah. The account alternates between Jesus' activities of healing and casting out demons and major blocks of his teaching, including the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapters 5 through 7, Lots of parking there, just letting you know. The Parables of the Kingdom, chapter 13. The Olivet Discourse, chapters 24 through 25. The Sermon on the Mount includes the Beatitudes, verses 3 through 12. Uh, chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. And the Lord's Prayer, chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. The book closes with the Great Commission in chapter 28. A recurring theme is the conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders, You'll see them with a capital J when it talks about the Jews, culminating in his pronouncement of seven woes upon them in chapter 23. As do all four gospel accounts, Matthew focuses on Christ's three-year ministry and his death and resurrection. Matthew probably wrote his gospel in the 50s or 60s AD. Let's begin. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, story there, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father, the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nation, and Nation the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, different, different story there, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. It's giving you the story with that. And Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. If you just finished reading through uh, the Bible with me yesterday, you'll recognize almost all of those names. Verse 12. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Christ is a title. It's not his last name. It means anointed one. I think it means anointed one. I always get that one wrong. Where's the note on this? Eh, there's no note on it. Anyway, I'm pretty sure it means anointed one. Um, It basically means the same as Messiah, that he is the one who was chosen. We'll read more about that in Genesis chapter 3. Again, the first week or so, there's a lot of things to go through. So, these readings tend to get a little long. Let's continue on. Verse 17. So, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. eh, And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. eh, And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations also. eh, There's a little fudginess in here. There's a whole note right here that kind of explains some of that, but he's speaking to a point. Verse 18. 
Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together in that way, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife. But he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Bringing up the rest of the notes for you. There we go. Now on to Ezra. Again, if you've been doing reading with me already, this is the um, this is the beginning of when people start going back into um, that. Well, Israel back into Judah. Um, as we finished with the end of Second Chronicles yesterday, um, it well not only that, but also with the end of Malachi. There are the promises that God is going to restore the people. Malachi, remember, was written uh, to the people who are already in the, um, uh, well, back into Jerusalem. Um, after this, after the events that are detailed here happened. But this is the, we're going to read through two, um, two books that talk about what happened after the Babylonian captivity. This is the first one of those. Let's read the introduction. The book of Ezra begins where Second Chronicles ends. As prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 44, 28, the Persian king Cyrus had sent exiles by Zerubbabel back to Jerusalem in 538 BC. Persia had defeated Babylon in 539. Despite opposition from the non-Jewish inhabitants of Judea, and after encouragement by the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the temple was rebuilt in 515. Then, in 458, Ezra led the second of three waves of returning exiles. By the time Ezra had arrived, the people had fallen again into sin. Ezra preached God's word and the people repented. Chapter 10. Ezra succeeded because God's hand was upon him. This book, perhaps written by Ezra, shows God's power in covenant faithfulness, moving uh, moving even pagan kings to accomplish his redemptive purposes. Verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps, Yahweh, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to rebuild the house of Yahweh that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with, excuse me, with vessels of silver and with gold, with goods and with beasts, with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. 
Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of Yahweh that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Amithradath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. We'll get to that in chapter 5. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were uh, 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Let's conclude today in Acts chapter 1. Let's go and read the introduction. Acts picks up where Luke's gospel leaves off, recording the early progress of the gospel as Jesus' disciples took it from Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the Mediterranean world, as Jesus had told them to do. The story begins with Christ's ascension and the events of Pentecost. As Gentiles begin responding to the gospel, the focus shifts to Paul and his missionary journeys. Acts forms a bridge between the four gospel accounts and the rest of the New Testament, showing how the apostles carried on Christ's work and providing a historical background for Romans through Revelation. The Acts of the Apostles is the second of the two New Testament books written by Luke. Like his gospel, Acts was a letter to Luke's friend Theophilus, written sometime in AD 62-64. to In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? We're going to park here for a quick second. I realize we're already almost an hour in, but this one's important. So, as we read through the gospel accounts, and as we read through the text of the Old Testament, you will find that there are certain promises that the Mashiach, the the Messiah, was supposed to do when he came in. They know that he is this Messiah, the, the Christ of God. But they had been told for generations that when the Christ comes, he is going to overthrow all kingdoms and powers and lords and and everyone who rules over them and will foist up his people, Israel, to the pinnacle of creation and that they will rule over all the other people with an iron fist. We'll see this as we read through the accounts that come through the prophets uh, later on in the year. But as we read through the Gospels, and even here, this is what people always expect. Because this is what they have been told. But what they've missed, what Jesus constantly recounts to the, um, to the ruling class of the Jews, they entirely missed the suffering servant section. This, his first coming, is the most important, far more important than when he takes the kingdom to himself. Because this is what establishes the process by which God provides salvation to his people. So, his disciples, which isn't just the 12 people, there were 12 apostles that were chosen, um, but the, an apostle just means sent ones, but there are 12 apostles out of the 
large group of people who followed him, those people were called the disciples. There's constant battles between these people where they wonder which of them is the greatest. Why would they have these battles? Because if Jesus were coming to establish a, 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 a political kingdom, whoever is the greatest, well, that's the vice president. And these are the people who are going to be taking over cabinet positions and all of these things. Those are the things that they're hoping for, that they had been hoping for. So when you read this, that's the context behind what's being asked. So that's why they're asking, so, um, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus responded to them, verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And they were gazing into heaven as he went, and behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same, excuse me, the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. A company of persons was in all about 120 that's the disciples we just talked about, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us in his allotted share in this ministry. Now, no, this happens before they've been, before they've been given the Holy Spirit. This is important. Now, this man was uh, rather acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. Uh, falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known uh, in the in excuse, starting over. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, "May his camp become desolate." And let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. Looking through this here, I want to make sure you get all the notes. There we go. Okay, back to verse 21 now. So, one of the men who have uh, accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness of his resurrection. And they put forward two, Justice, oh, sorry, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Mattathias, or Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, or sorry, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So, what is this lots that they were casting? It's basically what it is, is they, and there's a lot of people who do the same thing with prayer where you don't know how to do one thing or another, or how to react to something. So you go to God in prayer and you say, God, these are the things that I've come up with. And I think I'm making the right decision, but I don't know. So, um, you know, and 
the way that it worked with the priests, they had what's called an Urim and a Thummim, which are two stones, and they would pull out one or the other. One was a positive, the other one was a negative, and they would, you know, present to God an option, and then whatever they pulled out, they would go in faith, saying that this is what God has chosen for us to do. Because they don't know what it is until they pull it out, because the stones were identical, just different in color. So, casting lots is the same kind of thing. Personally, for me, I think that they were jumping the gun. Um, that they thought, well, we got to put someone else into that role. I think that God chose Paul, who we'll meet later on, um, for the role of the um, apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, Paul, in fact, even refers to himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. Just a thought. Again, I could be wrong, but just something I read in the text. All right, that is all for today. We are currently at one hour and almost six minutes, which, again, this isn't normal. This is the first day. There's a lot to get through. The first five or six days is going to be a little bit longer, and then we're going to settle back into our 20, 25-minute normal reading times. Um, that said, that is all of the reading and also all of the notes for today. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.